Hi, everybody. This is another mastery interview, and I've got a great person to interview here, someone that I've known for a long time. She's a great agent. Smitha Ramjandani is uh, in New Jersey, and so Smitha, say hi to everybody. Hi, everyone. And uh, so tell us um, your background, because uh, to me, it's so fascinating. Let's go all the way back from when you were in India and how you got to the United States and how did you get into real estate, because your story with your family, everything that went on out there is really interesting. Um, well, I'll try to make it as short as possible, but um, all right. So I grew up in Bombay um, in a part of uh, India, which is... Uh, which is absolutely fabulous. It's an island. And I grew up um, quite a bit on the streets of Bombay. Um, but then my mom um, and my dad moved us to this really um, small um, apartment, which was about 312 square feet apartment that I grew up in, but in a very good location. So uh, we were fortunate enough to move out of the streets and go into an apartment that um, we could we could flourish from there. Uh, our parents made sure that we went into English school and not a different school. It was more expensive, but um, they did push us to go to the next level. Um, and then um, as time passed on, I studied a lot. Um, usually girls don't study as much yeah. and don't even graduate. So I was the third um, from my family. So I have two older sisters and a younger brother. But um, in terms of the hardship and in terms of the determination to move forward and grow from a very, very um, low class into a middle class was a very huge struggle so for When you say streets, tell them exactly what that means because you kind of brushed over that, but it wasn't okay. that easy. You lived literally, it was tough, wasn't it? Yes, it was. It was basically in a refugee um, section of Bombay, um, which is basically on the streets. We don't have bathrooms. We had to go on the streets um, to the bathroom or, um, and also take showers kind of in a small little corner and, you know, take shower with your clothes on with a bucket of water. That's all you had. So it, it was very hard, um, but that what grounds me and makes me very humble in terms of what you had to go through. And then when we moved to this small little apartment, before we moved, my mom really sold all her jewelry and made sure that she was able to do that. But before we got possession, um, we stayed in a garden. Um, and that's where we stayed for three days before we got possession wow. um, to the apartment. And then we were very lucky because it was only, we had a private bathroom, which was like unbelievable to have. Um, and it was a studio, but, but we managed and I grew up there, I was really happy. And, you know, we, we moved on a little bit. My dad worked very hard. My mom actually um, was really inspiring because then she started a small salon in the house of a, such a small place. We have a business running from that house. Um, so growing up, um, you know, at night, we used to make products, beauty products and, uh, we used to make wigs and hairdos, and um, and that's how we expanded. And then mom, as I grew older, then we expanded to three other salons. Wow. So, and then you come to the United States, right? So you, yes. <laughs> how did that happen? And then, and then, so for the United States here, and then into real estate. I, I don't even know if I know that whole story. <laughs> um, well, you know, I fell in love uh, with Raul, and Raul was... Um, was in United States studying. He was only 15. We fell in love. We had a relationship back and forth for seven years, um, long distance, which was fabulous because I could have my own single life and he could have his own single <laughs> life. And then when he came down, we had like, okay, we're a couple. Yeah, yeah. In a way, it was a fun type of relationship because you could still do what you wanted to do in terms of your career. Right. So um, when we were when I was running the salons and handling people and teams and you know handling staff, um, I decided to pursue my master's. And none of my family members ever graduated from my dad's or mom's side ever graduated um, college. Right. So it was a big deal, um, and I went in one of the best universities in India, 
and graduated from there. And then I decided to do my master's, which while running the business seven days a week, um, I ran the business. I went to school in the evening after seven o'clock after shutting down the salon and then studying from seven to 10, ten, we had our classes. Then from 10 to 12, we had the library open till midnight and then I would come home. Wow. So, you know, it was good. It was all the focus and just beating the odds that I absolutely want to graduate and want to do my master's. But then when I fell in love with Raul, we decided I knew that my growth wasn't going to be in India as much or opportunities because you had to get married very young. Um, and I was the odd one out being over 21 and still not married. So, um, and the opportunities were less for me. And, and I feel like I think it was a good move. So I left everything behind and I moved to United States in 1996 of September. Um, and then, uh, you know, I got married in December, but in the meantime, I was like wondering what I want to do. I started looking at salons because that's what I knew really well. And I had done my management. So I was like, okay, let me, let me look at salons. But because of the licensing law and everything else, you know, I would have to go back to school, do the hours. And I wasn't willing to do that. Um, then I started dry. Then Raul suggested, how about you become a real estate agent, it's less investment. I, I wanted to be a lawyer, so I went, applied to a lot of universities, and they told me to that I they would not transfer my credits. So there was disappointment about what I wanted to do and study further, which was not going to be possible because financially we were not not too great, even in the United States. Right. So finally, I decided, okay, I'll become a real estate agent. We started driving. It's kind of funny and we're seeing all these expensive cars and I'm like, Oh my God, these are all expensive cars. What's going on here? I said, I could do this. Um, went for an interview with a lot of brokers. Um, I didn't have a suit. So I had one black jacket that I bought. Um, I can't even remember. Was it brand new? I think it was brand new. I bought for like 10 bucks or something. I bought a black jacket with jeans that I had and I went for my interviews. And at that time you couldn't go for interviews in your jeans. Um, and the well, couple of the brokers said, why are you in your jeans? I said, that's all I own. And they were like, okay. Um, and I was young. So I got a lot of pushback from brokers already stay thinking or judging me that I'm not going to be successful because I just relocated from India. I got my license in December of 96, um, just after my wedding. And I started real estate, I would say probably to be realistic. 1997. Wow. And so how did you, um, how did you start finding business? I mean, you listen, not only are you starting a new career, but you're coming from another country. You know, nobody, right? Correct. How did you get things ramped up? So my first year, I must have cried a million times. <laughs> um, it was, it was hard to adjust with the married life, no family. I was very successful and then I had, didn't have enough money. And I was just like, what is going on here? So it was a lot of stuff that was happening, but also when I started out, there were no young agents. It was mainly, um, people that were either retired or had a second career. Right. So having a young person, I was the youngest in the company that I joined. Uh, it was a challenge to begin with. Um, so I've had doors slam on me, open the door and they would slam the door and say, Oh, you're like my granddaughter, get out of here. Um, so I had a lot of pushback. So I must, I think I cried, like I said, a million times, I quit real estate. I would say at least a hundred times, at least. <laughs> that I, sounds familiar. Yes. And I figured out that, you know, going through the emotions of trying to understand the people the houses and um, I started calling and driving like crazy maniac and taking down numbers and just calling people. Hmm. And that's how I started my career. Why didn't you just give up? I mean, you know, it was so easy just to give up. You can, giving up is easy. It really is easy. You can just say, okay, I'll do something else. It wasn't for me. That, um, attitude was never acceptable to us when I grew up. It was not acceptable. So we grew up saying, if it's, if it's hard, 
that means that you're doing something right. Because if it was easy, everyone would do it. Um, so for me, failure was not an option um, because I eloped from India. So that was not an option for me to be able to go back ever. So to me, if you're doing something, either you really figure it out that it's not for you and you at least take two years before you decide whether this is for you or not. Right. So right. that's why I stuck there. Yeah, I like that. And then um, what, how did you start seeing things turn around in real estate? When did you see things starting to go, okay, uh, I don't need to go back to India. Uh, <laughs> no, marrying Raul is a good idea. <laughs> when things started going in the right direction, what, how, how did it all start moving in the right direction for you? So I think after the first, I think, six months in real estate, I really started calling um, for sale by owners, um, and just driving through neighborhoods. And then I got a break and I got my first listing and it was a retired couple. And they were just absolutely impressed with my enthusiasm. And I was very honest with them saying, this is my first transaction. This is going to be something I'm not experienced, but I, I have people that are supporting me with experience. So the first listing I took, they loved my enthusiasm. I did not know how to fill out the forms and they actually signed the listing document blank. <laughs> and I got it signed blank. I came to the office screaming my head off and I told the manager, like I got my listing and my mentor and they were like, okay, what's the price? Where is the street? What is it? And I said, here's the document. And they're like, oh no, it's not legal to just have them sign blank documents. <laughs> so I had to go back, um, fill it out. So it was kind of exciting, um, you know, but sadly that particular listing, I would not say sadly, but I did an open house every weekend, mm -hmm. every Sunday for six months. That house actually never sold. Wow. But I got three more transactions from that particular house, but I did Sunday open house every single day. That's how I started my career. Yeah. So you said something, first of all, I want to remind her, this is New Jersey, right? Yes. So she's in New Jersey, Metro market, a lot of competition, but you said something here. Enthusiasm is what got you to get that. And I think sometimes we forget that we should be a little enthusiastic sometimes on what we're doing. So people go, Oh my gosh, because enthusiasm trumps, Education sometimes it just affects oh, yeah. energy and and then you said open houses on a regular basis. I mean, how many open houses do you think you did before you started seeing stuff happen? I mean, that's a long time ago, but I mean, it wasn't like you did one open house and all of a sudden you had business. No, I did open houses every Sunday. I mean, I'm telling you, I gave up pretty much everything. And I put up signs for all the top agents that I forgot to mention. Um, so what I did was I reached out to the top agents from the office and I said, I'll be happy to put up the signs for you before you go to your open house. And I will pick up the signs after your open house. Since I was already dressed and I had open houses already for myself, I was happy to do that. So I was able to ask them any questions when I wanted them you know, to be answered, or I had some questions about a client or a house, I was able to call them and say, can you help me out? I have an answer. I have a question because I gave them something of value that I was willing to give 45 minutes of my time before and after the open house that they didn't have to do that. They absolutely loved it. Wow. That is very smart. I got to say, and you know, you've known me for some time. I have never heard that from you. Plus I have never heard that period that you actually went and pick up their signs, not because you're, you're doing that open house, just to get information, to have that time with that person to get information. That's to me, very smart. I mean, yeah, that's I how I, yeah. <laughs> so it was, I realized at that point that I, you know, I'm too new. Um, people are not going to trust me, but I had to give them something to say, well, you can trust me on terms of I'm going to show up. I'm going to do what I want, what I'm telling you that I'm going to do. And that's how I created my relationships. Wow. And then, um, then, you know, you were growing, things started to roll into place. And then was Raul in the business within the beginning or how, how did he jump in? Um, no, so, so to go back in terms of the business, I realized that there were a lot of 
um, houses and price point that I would not be able to touch. So I had to find my own people. What I mean by that is I started specializing in um, townhomes and condominiums mm -hmm. because that was a price point and an age group that people were able to relate with me. So I tried to do the higher price point, but I knew that I was not getting accepted in those. So that's how I started my career, like trying to find my own people and then trying to, trying to go from there. So I think that's very important if you're starting your career. Right, right. So you, you actually, uh, when you say your own people, is that people that you could relate to age-wise that were in these houses that you can actually now, you know, they knew that you knew something. If you went to the higher ends, you know, it, it was like, okay, how much experience do you have in the higher end? Right. It was more high rises and condos because that's what I grew up in. Right. So I knew community living. I knew how that works. Um, so that was much more uh, comfortable for me. And I was a lot more natural and honest. But I did, I, I will say though, I did try to fake wearing my fake glasses. I put chalk around my head to make myself look older. I tried to fake it. It was a disaster because finally I decided I just have to be very real. Yeah. And you put chalk in your hair? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, Smith. I still have those glasses that I, I faked it. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. So, uh, and so did anybody go, hey, what's that white stuff in your hair? Oh, it's just I, naturally gray. I tied up my hair and it was just white and wore my glasses, but it didn't work. Oh, gosh. And then, and then you started getting a hang of this thing. I mean, things started happening for you. You hit that niche market and then what happened? <laughs> um, then I, I went into a community. I mean, I pretty much picked a few communities and I learned it in and out. Every floor plan, every model, square footages, I knew it, I still know it, in and out. And it wasn't easy at that time. You had to go to the town, you had to get all the information through the town, know the streets. I knew every street by order, like if you made a right here, if you made a left here. So I really studied really well so when i got when i went for an appointment they were like blown away because i knew the floor plans i was comparing which floor plan is with what floor plan and the names right um as i grew there was an agent one of the top agents that pretty much got 90 percent of the business there and in a year she was out of that community completely and that's how that's how i grew it wasn't like i was going to attack her in any way which i did not do it was just like i was getting the market share and from there, I started growing. Um, and then I hired an assistant after I did about 50 transactions. Perfect, perfect. And then, uh, and then you start bringing family members in. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, uh, well, my mother-in-law was a licensed real, age, a real estate agent, but she had a full-time job. So she was, she was really not doing anything. And then Raul joined me about 10 years ago. 10, 11 years ago. So we're now, when you started, so you're almost 20 some years in the business. Mm -hmm. From when you started to now, what have you seen has been the biggest change? For me personally, mm -hmm. or the business? I think both for you and the industry yourself. Okay. So for me, I learned to really focus on my strengths and delegate the other things that I'm not so good at. So in terms of small things like, like it's boring for me to go and put a lockbox and um, you know, drop off brochures or design my own brochures or um, I just, just delegate all of that stuff. My biggest focus and my strength is the sellers and buyers follow up once I find a client, I leech on like there is no tomorrow. That, is, that does not surprise me about you. <laughs> so, so let me, and I know this, that prospecting has something to do with the success that you've had also. And I know it's always a challenge. How, mm -hmm. how did you find the leads? How did you continue to find business so that you kept that flow going? So when I started initially, I would say probably the first 10 years, um, I did 
when initially, I think the first couple of years, I did about 300 calls a day. And that was easy because we did not have do not call list or anything like that. So it was, it was a different time at that time. So it was easier to do that. And the cold calling, I always got listings for sale by owners, got listings. Um, and that I was very, very strong about. And I converted almost all of the guests from the open houses. And I do not like open houses, but I, am, I know I'm really good at it. Right. Wow. And so now with the situation with the do not call list, we uh, are, and you're good at conversion. You're, you're, you're good. Once you capture that person, and I call it the Smitha web, right. Right, they can't get out. But um, what would you suggest to people now? in the situation that we're in today's market. And again, I, I wanted to ask you again, how, what do you see as the biggest difference? Now, before there wasn't do not call, now we have that. Uh, technology is much different than when you first got in. So now you have to keep this business going. So what do you focus on now? So right now I focus a lot more on open houses mm -hmm. um, and social media. Okay. And um, what about social media? What, tell me about what you do there. So social media, I mean, I know like a lot of people put their stories and they say where you are. I, I haven't done that much, the videos and stuff, but I do post a uh, once a week motivation post on my business page. Mm -hmm. um, and then we post two or three things that we post one where it talks about a particular town and a price point, like how many houses are available. Um, I think that really gives a good return um, that you're kind of specific. You also post things that you have sold. Um, I know they sound boring, but you must have some absolutely spectacular photos to attract and have conversations with or acknowledge people that have shown some interest on your page. Um, you must talk to them and you must, you know, type and kind of chat with them. Um, with open houses, um, I have music. I have about maybe nine or 10 signs mm -hmm. um, out right. always. Um, we do a lot of pre-launch for open houses on social media. Um, and that kind of, and, and that kind of really sets the tone um, in terms of open houses, I would say those are the most um, easy way to connect with a client and, and kind of rope them in on how to trust you because now you're face to face. Okay, so you're using that to kind of bring them in. You got to bring them in, correct. So I'm very non threatening in terms of open houses. I know that most people say you have to make them sign in. And so I do it a little bit differently. I have some great music on. Um, I'm very, I'm dressed really, really well um, that I'm ready. I'm, I know the area really well. I have um, beautiful brochures. I have an iPad with me at all times. Um, and if the, sh if, for example, like certain things like your body language, how you stand, how you talk, all of those things have to come across really friendly. Um, and when they come in, I'm all, you know, nobody never shakes your hand if you don't go first. So I always go and introduce myself. And then I tell them like, you know, I know you know how to look at an open house. So why don't you just walk around? And they're like, oh, you don't want us to sign in? And I'm like, no, you could sign in a little bit later. I want you to relax and walk through the house. I'll be on the first floor with you. Um, but you can walk through and I'll just be right behind you. And they're like, okay. So they're very relaxed at that point because I'm not talking. Mm. I'm letting them sink in for the house. And then when they go on the second floor, I'm just standing on the second floor for security reasons and safety reasons. And then they walk through. And then when they go down, let's say there's a basement, I do the same thing. I wait outside. Right, and right. when they come back up, you know, they're like a lot more relaxed and I'm like, you know, would you, would you please share your story with me? Like, what are you thinking about this home? I'm not asking anything about them. I'm asking to tell them the story, how they feel about the house. Right. And then they're, they're like, okay, we like this. We don't like this, you know, and they start talking to you about it. And then I ask the question, oh, you know, 
um, since you're here and you're, you're, thank you so much for sharing your story. Are you working with someone? Mm. That's my number one question I ask them. So here's what happens here, I think. You're, um, the, the, you know how the people have the, uh, the, the wall that they bring in, you know, they're, of course. they're the wall, right? So you allow them to bring it down if you're relaxed, they walk around and then uh, you're asking them their opinion. Now you've got engagement. I know you, you've got a great smile. So you're smiling, you're dressed up, like you said, because I wrote down, you know, you're pretty much dressed. And then you know you've got that one question that you probably ask every time, but it looks like it's just conversation, but you, I know you ask it every time, right? Yes. Good, and then from there, what happens? So, and sometimes, you know, people will lie because they don't want to tell you, because they don't want you, they don't want you to call or text or email or whatever. Right. And they say, yeah, I'm working with an agent. I'm like, great, that's wonderful. Um, you know, but would you mind just, you know, signing in for me? And if you could sign in your agent's name and number also, that would be very helpful. So I don't bother you, um, you know, with questions. And maybe I can reach out to your agent, letting them know, you know, what the story behind what you shared with me about the house. Is that okay with you? And most of the time, the answer is like, well, I don't, I don't have the agent's name and number with me. Um, I said, that's okay. Then just share your number and email with me. And how would you like me to um, communicate with you? Would you prefer an email or a phone call or a text? And do you prefer it at the night or in the morning? So you have your, what's interesting, it looks like you're just casually, but I know that this is a thing that you do every time. Yes. So it, it looks like it's spontaneous, but it is a, a, a system. It's a strategy that you're using. Correct. Right. So Correct. what percent do you think are people give you the true information? Just roughly. What do you think? I would say probably at least 80 percent. OK, that's good. Yeah. So that's 85 really percent people do give real information. What what do you think um, you struggle with right now with this changing of the market? What is the biggest struggle that you have right now? I think the revolution with the real estate market and the unknown in terms of as an agent, um, you know, when you're bombarded with all this information um, and the news about, you know, there's this I buyer, you could do this and you could get this and this is the new trend and you should also do this. And I think that at, at certain point, you have to protect yourself from the information. Mm. And I think that's the hardest part because there are so many Facebook groups. There are a lot of silly questions being asked and a lot of the answers are a waste of my time, honestly, because I'm reading a question that's so basic that it really annoys me. So I'm at this point in my life, I feel like you got to save your time. Mm. Yeah. T control it because what happens is y it throws you off, doesn't it? Yeah. The it, chaos. The chaos throws you off. Yeah. And as you become more of a producer, there's more things coming at you. Yes. So you have to have a laser focus on what your goal is and how you're going to get there and you must look at it at least once a week. Look at your goals. Look at your goals. So what do you think as we're coming into a new year shortly, um, what do you think is the change that's gonna take place in 2020? Cause you just mentioned something, you got iBuyer, you've got all these different, and I believe that we are losing some of the consumer because we're allowing it to take place. If we don't show our value to them, you know, if we're not the Nordstroms, then mm -hmm. they're not going to shop with us. If we're, if we're showing, if we're going to create that value coming into 2020, what is your focus going to be? I think that the biggest focus you have to do is keep your clients very, very close to you. What I mean by that is I'm telling you, I almost get 99% of the time I get asked from a buyer, will you share my Will you share your commission? And that's going to be a very normal question 
that is being asked now and it's going to be asked even more in 2020. How do you handle that? So I basically tell them I do not do that. And, um, but I know there are other agents that will do that and you're most welcome to call them, but we do not do that. We don't do that for any of our clients, our service and our reputation and how much money we're going to save you in your negotiations is going to be a lot more than what you're asking back. I like that. Right. Because if you don't, but if you don't do that, if you don't have the package, that's why they keep asking. Yes. Now, how much, how much of uh, the people that you talk to actually go, okay, see you later, Smith. Uh, we're we're going to go someplace else. You know what? They've all come back. They actually, it's just a thing that they ask. And uh -huh. when you say no, and you say what you're going to do for them, it's all about them. It has nothing to do with us. It is all about the consumer and the client. And that's what you focus on. The minute you tell them, what you can say for them and what quality and let's say there are exclusive listings that you get your hands on. you got to explain it to them a little bit and then move on. That's a very, I hope people got that because that's a very valuable thing. I think we're, we're getting so scared and, but you stand your ground. But the second point is that it's about them. Cause I think sometimes agents will go like this. Well, you know, this is my commission and I only get this. And it's not about us and our commission. It's about how you, you said that you're actually going to save them money by giving them uh, the right service and the skill that you have in negotiation. Right. Correct. So go, oh my gosh, that's great. So, and you don't lose people. It's when we no. don't have the dialogue, you have a specific dialogue. The answer is no. <laughs> and then you, with, you know, with the, with the, with the second part of your, situation that you're telling them. I think that's great. Now, uh, let's just talk about team building because sure. I know you've been up and down a little bit with teams. Yes. And <laughs> you've all been there. I've been, I, I know a little bit about that with you. Uh, what is so, uh, what's a struggle with teams at times? What, what did you find had been difficult for you and what did you learn as you build this team? <laughs> So, I mean, thank you for you because you explained me how to delegate. I was a total control freak and you really taught me how to really start giving up your control. And I think that's one thing if you understand, I think that's the biggest piece to be able to have a little bit of freedom for everyone because your team, you're helping the team and the team is helping you. So if if your mentality is going to be, well, they're just going to help me, it's not going to work. So, so the way, our, the way we, I've learned is to hire, I think you've heard this a million times, hire the right person. So over the years I've experienced it, usually in the interview, people really say everything that they want, to, want you to hear which is normal. Mm -hmm. But once you start working with them and in three weeks to four weeks, you realize that they're not what you thought they are, you fire them right away. Mm -hmm. And that's what I have learned where I have bled through for six months and I knew exactly what was lacking, but I just was fearful to fire someone. Um, and as I learned to do that, I think, that was the biggest learning, learning curve for me to, and also understand how to give certain jobs to certain people. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very important thing. And last year, I actually cleaned my whole team out. I fired every team member. Uh, even Ralph? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> every person, um, I actually, it was very, very scary. Right. I was like, I just got to go clean. And it was the best thing we did because it just relieved the wrong people and the wrong culture in your team. Hmm. And as we hired the right people and now we have a fabulous team and we've actually increased our business significantly. Interesting. So um, you said this thing about hiring. They're always, you know, it's always a great interview. They used to call it the halo the halo interview, right? Everything's perfect, right? They get the yes. halo and then 90 days you found like this thing has a devil's face. Oh my God. Yeah. After a while. So fire, hire slow, fire fast. Yes. Is, is what I hear. And then 
making sure that person is in the right position uh, in the job. And, you know, one thing I saw from a couple of other agents that they actually auditioned the person for a while, maybe, maybe for a short amount of time, which is good for you. So now you're seeing business picking up. You've got, how does it feel? I mean, now, you know, what's your mindset like when you have that right team? How does that make you feel when you go in there in the office? Because there were days that you weren't really excited about going to the office because you had mm -hmm. all the oil. How does that make you feel when you have that right group together? Oh, it's awesome because we're all lifting each other up. I mean, it's really, really good because now we trust each other and but the number one thing is that you must know what your team member's goal is. Mm. Their goal, their personal their goal. goal, their personal goals. If they want to have 10 transactions a year or they want to have five transactions a year, what is their goal for the next three years? Mm. And you sincerely want to meet their goals. Right. And they feel they got to feel that it can't just be. No nope. little talk that you do and then you forget about it. they got to really know you're coming from the heart basically. Yes. Right? That you really yes. care about them. And people um people sense that you are looking out for them. And they they will work much harder at times for you than they work for themselves. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the appreciation, it's the smallest things as long as you recognize that they did something above and beyond whether it's for a client or for you or they sacrificed something, we have to appreciate them. And that is the number one thing that I have learned in terms of appreciating your team and not, not always monetizing their time. Interesting, what, and explain that. So what I mean by that is like, I don't allow my team to complain in terms of, I wasted my time by showing this buyer 10 houses. Hmm. So in terms of, I, I explained, did you ask these questions before you took them out and showed them 10 houses? Um, but once they do that, I go back and say, okay, what did you learn from it? How was their body language? What happened? And they, now they have grown to understand the client's body language. And then you're, you're also appreciating and telling them the positive about what they did was wrong and what they did was perfectly right and how you grow from that. Wow. So, and appreciating their tenacity, appreciating the time that they want to put in. So it's, I tell my team members, like we do open houses on Sundays, but sometimes we do, we, most of the time we do two open houses. So we also, I also teach time efficiency in terms of I'll tell them you're already dressed, you already have signs in your car, might as well do two open houses. So sometimes we'll do an open house from 11 to one and the next open house is from two to five. Wow, I think that's a great idea. Yeah, and you you get a full you get a full range of possibilities for leads coming in that whole day. Correct. Excellent. And Saturdays is all for buyers. Gosh, um, the you're you're almost a coach for these people. Uh, yeah, I try to be. <laughs> I try to be. So, which is good. I mean, uh, yeah. because you're acknowledging the things that they do right. I think so much that we acknowledge sometimes the wrong things. And, you know, with kids, we do the same thing with, with kids sometimes that we acknowledge, don't do that. That was wrong. But, you know, uh, and I hear my wife sometimes telling me, you know, you know, you just encourage your kids because, you know, I'm really good in business, but at home, you, we get so emotional with our children. So I think that's great that acknowledge their successes and project success in them. You're like, a projector projecting success into them so they can actually succeed and in turn everybody's happy in working together which i think is fantastic so what's the future for uh uh the smitha team what do you think <laughs> what's that gonna look like uh, well our goal is um probably in about i would say two years or maybe even shorter um my goal is that uh, the team member takes a lot of the responsibility and I can really not sit back, but I would love for them to grow and make the money that they want to make the money um, and really succeed. Um, 
And I want them to do it in the brand that we are in with our culture and grow so that, and I want them to understand that and then grow in another area. Yeah. So right now we're, we're, we're trying to work on um, a big project for a huge Caribbean island um, that might be available for sale. So like I want to do global and I want to expand from there, um, you know, bigger, bigger projects. Look, I know you, you're always looking for the next bigger project. So yes. it doesn't surprise me at all when you want to go global, which I think is fantastic. So first of all, great interview. Thank you for all Thank those you. tidbits. How can someone, if they have questions, get a hold of you? Call me, call me, um, email me, um, private message me. Um, I do respond, um, text messages and Facebook messages. I do when I'm driving, of course I don't. I will always respond to a phone call. Um, sometimes I get delayed, uh, but just call me. My number is 973-953-7777. And just find me on Facebook or Instagram, Smitha Ramchandani, and you know, you'll find me. Awesome. Smitha, so happy for you. Great story, and, and I'm so happy for your success. Tell Rao, yeah. said hi. I will. Thanks for being on the Espresso Mastery session with us, and uh, we look forward to talking to you soon. Thank you so and, much. It's yeah, an honor. We're going to you go global soon. We're going to bring it back yes. when we go global. <laughs> it's an honor. Thank you so much. See you later. Bye-bye. Okay, bye.